lots of people started their communities in those tents because they could put it up in a, a couple of days with bamboo and stuff like that. And you could live in it for, you know, a year or two years, they're really good tents. So that was one of my first business, if you like, activity was to keep us going by doing that. And we had lots of tents. And uh, so where to go now? I don't know how much time have I got left, boss? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? So um, can't go into any detail, but what I've, I've done, I started Dumb and Under, it's getting to be pretty well known now as the, one of the best around, if not the best. And it, it's been going for 50 years. Like we had our anniversary last year, 50th. And um, I'm very grateful that's getting some, uh, getting out there and people are getting to know about it. And we just produced a, uh, one of the women there decided it'd be a good idea to, uh, to have a record of the history of the place. So um, what they did was they just asked everybody that ever lived there or grown up there to write what, what it was like for them. You know, so it's a fascinating read. Blew me away. I still haven't finished it. But um, you can understand a lot about what it's like to be in that kind of community. That, and most important I want to mention is the key thing, I believe, that's kept us together for 50 years was we had a common purpose. Common purpose is the key thing. I don't need to hold it there. Um, so that that can keep you together through thick and thin. But it, as soon as you that that becomes wavering and people start behaving in ways that aren't consistent with your original purpose, it can be very, very troublesome. So you have to avoid that at all costs. So one of the ways we did that was we have a uh, difficult to get in and easy to get out process. So it was hard to get in and you had to come along and do some work days and see if you really were interested and then you could come on temporary and that would be like a couple of weeks. You could stay there and work with us because we're always doing stuff and then um, you could do six months from there. Okay, only for six months trial. And so nothing less than six months trial. And then it could be extended by any party, either party. Another three months, another three months, whatever. So that, that I believe is really important. The other thing that I was adamant about, this is what we've got to do, is use consensus. Decision making, none of this majority rules. Rubbish, what are you talking about? You're growing a community, a family. These people are going to live with the rest of your life and depend on. You, know, you want everybody fully on board with everything you do. So that's really important and that's something I like to explain to people how to do it. It's not hard once you know. It works. If you don't know, it takes forever or it doesn't work. And I've seen you know, outstanding examples of this happening, uh, both when we were in defence against 150 police coming tomorrow at Terania Creek and I was trying to make sure everything was non-violent. That was my job and police liaison was part of that. So um, what we did was confront the situation and now we have the same story. We have to confront what's going on and we have to get right in front of it. You can't get on the side, but you can slip in from the side and that's good too. But you have to stop this thing, but you don't stop it directly because that's where they've got all the muscle. So you have to come in divergent and you have to go where it's needed and that's what we did at Terania Creek. I said, no, don't worry about the politicians, don't try and change their head, go to the public, get in front of the public, let the public see what's going on. It woke everybody up, you know, and it took four weeks and we had these police coming every day trying to stop us and lock us up. And if you see, saw the movie, Give Trees a Chance, it's an awesome explanation of, because she was right there, they were on the front line recording everything as it happened. So. It's, it's a brilliant thing. It's been shown at the Opera House, you know, and all the top cops were looking at it, trying to figure out what they could do about it, this situation. You know, because we were all being nice to everybody. We were nice to all the police. There was nothing nasty about us. And we were all colourful and entertaining 
and the media loved it. You know, so the first story on ABC national television three nights in a row. I found out later it's never happened before with anything. You know? So it just shows what you can do. And this is what I'm really on about, is how do we get mobilised to do what needs to be done? Because if we don't do it, who is going to do it? It isn't going to happen. And we are so close to the edge now, which I saw coming all that time ago, did what was appropriate, but nobody's ever been seriously interested. So now I'm set up, I've run a research institute, approved by CSIRO. We can focus this on learning. We've got a massive learning story, the whole world has, and we've got to do it. And the way to do it is get into communities, learning communities, learn how to live well with the land that you're living on and with your neighbours and make strong communities. That's the only way. That's how Vietnam survived against the US. They were all sustainable communities everywhere. So you couldn't just knock off the top, you know, and all that stuff. We're so totally vulnerable, it's ridiculous, you know. The whole of America can be shut down with one high altitude burst of neutrons and stuff. And it just knocks off all, all electronic gear. Where's America without electronics? They can't fight, they can't do anything. And that's all, and Russians know that, and the Americans know that. So this is all ways of us keeping us heads down. Because, oh, we need them to look after us, we can't deal with that. No. <laughs> you just have to look after yourself and your neighbour. That's the key. So that's what these communities are about. They're about getting together to save us all, to save the living system. We can't deny doing that or we're not worthy of living and we should get out and shouldn't even be here. I mean, we're living in the most incredible creation in the whole universe as far as we know. And, and we're not even noticing. We're stuck on a little screen reading some rubbish story or playing some stupid game trying to beat your mate about something. I mean, it's horrific. And how do you confront that? Well, you've got to get together, you've got to get organised, you've got to have the entertainment and the technical skills to put together the greatest show on earth. That's what I think is the way to do it. There's no point trying to fight. You've got to inform people and you inform them through edutainment. Right? Educate them through entertainment. Make them laugh off their face. You know, they're happy. And this is the best, the biggest market on the planet right now is happiness. There's almost none of it left unless you go into outer worlds within you, whatever, whatever way. You can do that. You can escape it. But if you, if you really care for this planet and would like to see it keep going and get better, now is the time, like never before, to do it. Now we can do it. There's all these people that are starting to wake up through how they can't trust government. They can't trust media. You can't trust it. Wake up. You cannot. Because it's got a purpose and that's to fulfil the coffers of the wealthy. That's it. Maximise profit. That's how they function. They told us that. We ought to know. They've got nothing else on their agenda. They don't care. Why should they? They won't keep their job. You know, and they won't make more than the other guy. You know, we're letting it happen. We're saying, it's OK, guys. You know, I'm busy. You know, I've got my kids to feed. I've got something, something, something. Well, you better learn, like an ancient Chinese thing, one of the book of early Chinese philosophy. And one thing struck me right away when I was reading, when I was pretty young. And it said, the superior man, in other words, the guy that's going to get on in life, that's better than others, perhaps, is the one that works out how to make his living with his left foot. Right? How do you make your living with your left foot? In other words, your least important member, right? Not your right arm, your left arm, your right hand, your right left hand, your right leg, your left leg. You get all the way down, you've got a foot left. Well, we'll get everything done with the foot. So now I can concentrate on what I'm doing here. That's what we should be doing, not spending our whole life trying to survive 
enough to hope pass on to our kids something. I mean, come on. It's a miserable way to live. No wonder people aren't happy. And it all can be changed just like that, just by everyone deciding, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. There's a way forward and I can show you the way forward. I'm organised, you know. Not, don't, don't work to pass on to the kids. So, did you say don't work too hard to pass things down to the kids? Is that what you said? Or the opposite? No, I'm still not. Sorry. Don't worry about the opposite. Don't work to pass on to the kids. You want to work hard to pass down things to the kids. I want to create the most wonderful world for my kids. That's what I'm saying. And that's what we should focus on. What we want, visualise that, put your energy into that, but don't start messing around with what you don't want. Spend all our energy talking about the problem and all those other people and what they, we're imagining they're thinking and doing. You know, imagination, just in your head. So why mess around and waste valuable headspace and your day-to-day -day moment doing something that isn't about what you want? Just get on with what you want. That's what Nimman's all about. That's what the 50th thing is. It's about the anniversary of people that came, had had enough, came up here and said, no, we're going to do something else. What are we going to do? And I, I was there. I was already there. I already bought my land the year before. I didn't know they were coming, you know. <laughs> and then it all came. And by then I was already up in Laos making the money to pay off the land and learning how to run a school and get recognition that I could do it and all the rest of it. And then I came back and there were all these hippies everywhere, you know. And that's fine. I was a hippie. I knew I was a hippie the, from the beginning. And so got finished with chemical engineering and went somewhere else and realised I needed to be a hippie, someone that was hip, someone that was aware, someone that knew what was going on. You're hip, man. That's what it means. It means being hip. You're hip. Yeah, I'm here, but I know what's happening, man. That's it. I guess that's enough. Thank you very much, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Natalie is here from the Neighbourhood Centre. Natalie Myers, uh, who works tirelessly in our community and has done for many years. Um, very respected member of our community. Uh, Natalie is going to um, provide an insight into sustainability and uh, the plan that uh, Nimbin has developed um, towards that goal uh, into the future. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, Dave. So I didn't know if anyone would be here today because it's not real clear from the program what's going on. Um, can you let me know when I've got 10 minutes left? Thanks, Dave, because I can crap on a bit. Um, okay, so originally I was asked by Jenny to come and talk about the visions for Nimbin in terms of food security, energy security, housing security, etc. And I went, well, that is the sustainable Nimbin community plan, so I should probably talk about that because in one hour there's no way we can talk about all those other topics in any kind of meaningful way. So then I didn't know who'd be in the room, so... I thought for the actual Aquarians in the room, I guess I'm bringing a message of hope. The vision is ongoing. We haven't dumped the vision in any way at all. It's an ongoing evolution. It's still a work in progress and we're very much on board with it. It's still going. We haven't dumped it. Um, for the younger people in the room, it was like letting you know it exists and trying to get people engaged in it because we need to do a revision of the plan. So this is the plan. Um, as you can see, it's quite a large document. Uh, see, look, lots of pages. Now normally when I do these things, I have data projectors and props and stuff, and I don't have that kind of stuff with me today. So, um, but basically, uh, currently, the plan is divided into these key focus areas, and I can hand around a little one of these so you can look at it closer. So I'll hand that around in a second. But as you can see, it's divided into the key focus areas of energy, social and political, food and farming, health and wellbeing, economic development, 
transport, housing in the built in environment, which is where the MIs come into it, um, environmental, environment and biodiversity, and arts and culture. And under each one of those key focus areas, there's a goal. Now, all of this has been set down by the community, by the way. Um, so the first version of this was in 2009. And in that very first version, we spent two days developing this plan. Um, and the first thing we did was gather up every plan that Nimbin community had created since Aquarius. And there were lots of them. <laughs> there were heaps of plans. And then we went through all these plans. So there were loads of them, including the visions of Nimbin plan. Um, we went through all these plans and we pulled out of it the things that have been achieved and ticked off, the things that have been recurring again and again in every plan Nimbin community had ever done, the same stuff was coming up, coming up, coming up. And then we talked about, well, why did this stuff keep coming up, coming up, coming up, but nothing ever happens? And then it was identified that, well, if you're going to have a plan, somebody needs to take a leadership role in relation to that plan to make sure it's a living, breathing document, follow it through, report on progress and revisit the plan and update it every so often. So we're in the third version. The current version was from 2016 to 2021, was a five-year plan. I'm oh, sorry, I should talk better into the microphone. And that five years expired in 2021 when we were due to do a revision. But COVID happened and then the floods happened. So now we're running a bit late. So we're scheduling it for this year to do the revision of the plan. So if I send around these, if you want to pass these around, then, then you can see how the plan is sort of structured. So the most recent version of the plan, in fact, all versions of the sustainable Nimbin community plans are obviously there's an underlying framework of sustainability and it, the 2009 version very much was driven by concerns about climate change mitigation. Um, now what we're going to have to build into it is climate change adaptation, sadly. You know, we fought the good fight to fight against climate change ever since the Aquarius time. Um, and even before that, a lot of us have put our bodies on the line to try and mitigate climate change and environmental destruction. But sadly, we are where we are today. So now we have to figure out what are we going to do now. Just double check my notes about what I reckon I was going to talk about. So since 2009, a lot of stuff has been achieved under this plan by the Nimbin community. So the Nimbin community is the drivers of this plan. The plan is goal focused, not problem focused. So the idea is here's the goal, this is where we want to get at. How are we going to get to there? Instead of going, these are all the problems, how are we going to fix them? So that is not the approach that is taken. It is a goal focused approach. Here's the goals, what other strategies we can take as a community to get towards those goals. And it's very much community driven in that it's not about what we want the government to do, what we want the council to do. It's not about that. It's about what we as a community can actually do, um, which is pretty important because you can spend the rest of your life figuring out what you want the government to do but our experience has shown us that the government doesn't necessarily come to the party. Um, so we have to do what we want to do as much as we can off our own bats. So the challenge for every plan that we've done is you had the community was given the task of coming up with strategies that needed no funding or very little funding, so no cost strategies strategies that might need some funding and then there were big picture blue sky ideas allowed as well that would need lots of funding 
Um, but those were also allowed in. But the task was you couldn't only put the blue sky stuff in that needed squillions of dollars from somewhere. Nonetheless, we have achieved some of those blue sky ideas. So in 2009, we had the idea of setting up the first community solar farm that required a lot of funding. We got the funding and we did set up the first community-owned solar farm in Australia. Um, that's since been decommissioned. I know, that was a great achievement at the time and it led the way to a lot of development in the renewable energy sector, especially at a community level. Not just our community, but other communities. Since then, those solar arrays have been gifted to the host organisations that were hosting them and they now are all over buildings all over Nimbin. Um, we've also achieved the purchase of 7 Sibley Street as a community, so the community bought that land. There was no funding at all involved in the purchase of that land. Um, the land was identified in the plan as being vulnerable if the wrong people got that land because of the proximity to the skate park and we didn't want a not young people liking person to buy that site and then be complaining about the skate park in particular. Um, so we'd already identified that site as being vulnerable, fell into the wrong hands, but at the same time under the plan, the community had identified they wanted a central base for all things sustainable, sustainable living, sustainable living technologies, sustainable skill sharing, all that, and that's what Seven Sibley Street is. So we bought it for that purpose. And again, it's a work in progress. We're currently building a toilet <laughs> there, um, which sounds like not much, but it's turned out to be the project from hell, I can tell you. Um, but it, we're building it. It's a composting toilet, so we're demonstrating composting waterless toilets, and it's built out of hemp masonry. So we're demonstrating the use of hemp masonry as a building technology. Oh, it's just been a shit fight, though. <laughs> <laughs> pun intended, um, because of COVID and then the floods. Um, so it's just been really difficult to get supplies and tradespeople and all the rest of it. But anyway, we're getting there. Would you, anyone want, want to do some rendering? Um, look, uh, yeah, I need some help us to do the external rendering. We've done the internal rendering. We now need to do the external rendering and after that the rest of it is not going to be too hard to finish. But that rendering is a really sucky job, trust me, because I did the internal <laughs> rendering. Um, so uh, other things that we've achieved under the, the plan, so in the food security area, um, the two farmers markets were set up under the plan. The food co-op was set up because of the plan. Um, and they're still running, obviously. Uh, what else have we... The, under the economic development stream, a lot of energy was put into Rainbow Power Company around employment opportunities and apprenticeships. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce was seriously reinvigorated by the community uh, to become a much more powerful voice in the kind of economic development sphere. And just a reminder, this is all about sustainability and underlying all of this is environmental protection and environmental has been the big issue. Um, so when we're talking about economic development, we're looking for that kind of economic development, real jobs, green jobs, jobs that are meaningful for people, jobs in arts, those kind of things. Um, and uh, what else have we achieved? We set up an MI think tank, which ran for a couple of years. Well, and I was kind of facilitating that and then I kind of suggested I should step back because I don't even live on an MO. But that kind of fell away after I wasn't there to drive it. So again, something that could be picked up again and keep running with it because there were some very useful conversations coming out of the MO think tank about MOs and how to deal with the complexities and the wicked problems that arise on the MOs. Um, and right now I can't think of other stuff, but there's tons of it. 
actually. There's a lot of stuff that's been achieved under the three versions of the plan since 2009. So you can see the goals are set out under each one of those headings. And without my glasses, I probably can't read them. And so the challenge is to come up with strategies that move us closer towards those goals. So where we are right now is the community of Nimbin. So, so far there's been probably around 600 people have, can, have been involved, have participated in the development of the plans to date and way more people than that have been involved in implementing the various parts of the plan. Um, each part of the... Each strategy is supposed to have a nominated driver of that strategy, so either an individual or an organisation. And in fact, the rule was it wasn't allowed to even go into the plan unless someone was nominated to drive that strategy forward, but we had some mixed success with that idea. So we need to work on that a bit more. Uh, so. I don't know if you can read that handout I gave to you about what the goals are. You can read it? So, what, what I was thinking was if we had younger crew in the room was trying to engage them in a conversation about how do we go about revising this plan this time round. So, in the past what we've done is huge community forums in the town hall with seven, several hundred people in them. The first one we did was a two-day forum. The second one we did was a two-day forum. And the third version of it, we did a one-day forum. But it involved everyone getting together in the town hall, hundreds of us, and then workshopping through the plan, dividing it into the different key focus areas and working our way through it. Um, but this is getting harder to achieve as times are moving on and a lot of the people that used to get in the room 20 years ago aren't even with us anymore. So they've either passed on, rest in peace to all of them, or they've left the community um, because of their personal circumstances or because of the housing crisis or all sorts of things I could go on about. So now I'm trying to figure out where do we go from here. So this is where I was going to throw it out to you people to see if anyone had some brilliant ideas for me <laughs> about how we go about engaging as many people in Nimbin as possible in the revision and the update of this plan. Um, and in particular, the voices that have been missing from the plan have been the young people who don't really like getting in a room full of old people and doing planning. And also they don't have capacity because they're flat out trying to just keep housing. Um, or our First Nations people. Once again, that format of a town hall full of people isn't really conducive to their participation. So yeah, I'm just looking for ideas and I've got one up the back. Do you want a microphone? Uh, my name's Rob. Um, um, what I'm thinking is uh, to bring young people into the community is not only they need to be welcomed into the community, but with opportunity on land. Um, in this area, um, rentals on the coast are impossible for most people. Um, and and also rentals out Lismore, Nimbin, Kyogle are also impossible due to the flood. So even those who are interested in moving to this area can't. Um, I have a good job, I work in reforestation, but it's still been very hard to, uh, to find an opportunity. So I actually almost, almost rented land just behind the bush theatre. Um, before my friends found a, a house in Bangalore. But, uh, but yeah, I've had that vision for seeing um, that we need to be 
There's a shortage of good organic food and of, of shelter. So what is lacking, the lacking bridge for young people is access to land, um, which is why part of the outreach for what I'd like to accomplish is directly reaching out to landowners and being instilled with that trust that young people can live there, um, possibly living in their own, um, you know, vans or caravans and being guided to establish temporary housing while uh, reforesting and ac establishing agroforestry and growing food as part of the uh, symbiotic relationship with the landowner. So it really needs to be a, um, a transparent offering of opportunity on land and welcoming for young people to be invited to the area, otherwise they don't feel like they can come. Just to say that that is part of, um, of our future um, ideals. We'd love to see you know, younger people coming to the area and, and affordability of land. There is, a, there is actually a um, uh, segment later on this afternoon in regard to community housing. So that's probably a good time to really delve into those issues. Uh, but we understand fully the, uh, the plight of the, of the younger people. The days gone by, um, the land affordability was there. So you know, that provided enormous opportunity for the earlier, you know, the, the people that came to, to the area with the vision, the same vision that you've got. The vision hasn't changed. It's only land prices that have changed. Um, and council's willingness to uh, to accept, you know, um, a more um, less regulatory situation with uh, with the housing. But there are people with big minds that can get behind this, and there is also people with um, with money. And um, you know, if they're approached the right way and um, good plans are put forward, I'm sure that we can uh, alleviate some of those issues. But the housing the housing forum will be a good one. Thanks. And I will say that's something that was discussed at length at the MA think tanks, how do we get younger people onto the land? And I think the older people who are on the land probably need to do some work around this because a lot of them aren't actually coping with the land anymore because we're all getting too old and, you know, I'm not quite as old as the Aquarians, but even I'm feeling it, you know. It takes a lot more out of me these days getting around whippersnippering five acres of land and dealing with weeds. And we need more young people in to help look after what we've actually built already. So how do we get them in? And that's a good point. Like we've got to find ways for the landowners to share somehow, but have that trust, you know, like you're saying. So... I think it's a very good point and I've written it down to add into the housing and the built environment conversation. Um, yes, your, what your question about uh, providing these opportunities, that's exactly what we would be doing on these communities. That that's a core part of it is to bring in young people and give them a, a real education in life and uh, have a network of these. Not We can't stop with one. We need them all over the place. And we can work in with owners that don't actually want to leave their land but they want help to grow it further or whatever. So we can slide into that as well. And we've got the legal and financial setup all readily available. So And they would all be connected together in terms of finance and it, learning and all those things that are going on. They become part of one growing network that's taking care of whatever we perceive is needed. You know, so they're doing the research on the spot in the, what they do and each, each project is a different learning. And what, what we're aiming at a lot is what's it doing to the people? How are those people handling it? Are they growing through it? Are they feeling better? Um, all these personal issues are so important because often get overlooked, the stress of getting the job done rather than say, hey, you know, you'll do much better when you're not stressed and so on. It's, a, it's looking at that whole, the whole thing of living. So we're probably calling these networks life communities or communities for life, I should say. 
So that's the purpose is about life and saving it and moving on. And you want to be there for life anyway. So communities for life. So um, my name's Alyssa and I've just moved here from Victoria. Thank you. And I was actually the Victorian federal candidate for the Legalised Cannabis Party. So I have clearly put my name to my cause and I'm backing up by moving here and getting as much education as possible. But... Previous to this, I was an aquatic educator. Well, I am an aquatic educator. And I've been involved in this social change that we've made in aquatic education through this country over the last 40 years. So, essentially, we've done the social change that you're looking for the rest of the country to engage in that you've created as a model here. And looking at this sustainability plan and having been involved in councils and... Um, engaged in that area of education myself for a long time. The, the biggest hole I see in this plan at the moment is how you translate this knowledge you all have to educate others to the same model. And, and I think that's essentially the one part you've missed out of this model is its marketability. The education package that you can create from the entire model rather than just elements of it, is where you haven't marketed this town's knowledge outside of it. You've marketed it really well inside it, so people want to come on the same page. But what we've got to do is get the rest of the country who aren't on that and model it to them. And you're right in that happiness is our final destination and this is why we came here for finding that peace, sanctuary and um, agency, our own agency to have control of our bodies and our right to do it here. And I think that's the biggest thing that the rest of the country has lost that you have as an asset and a uniqueness here. And if you can put that as an education portfolio, essentially, and how you're going to market it, you'll actually probably get a lot more people coming to you. At the moment, they've had to look for it. It wasn't actually advertised to them, which is by design. It was important that you had the right structure here in place, and I see that model needed to grow to develop. But I really think you're at the phase now where you need to be advertising it because the world wants to know how you did it. Oh, sorry, that's yours. I'm just taking away your stuff. Giveth, the Lord giveth and taketh away. Um, so, we did actually win the Premier's Award for the plan. Um, Nimbin did. We won the Premier's Environmental Sustainability Award. We won the Premier's, we won the overall Premier's Award. And we also won the Community Sustainability Award in that year. So we got two trophies, came home with two trophies. Um, so, and we do um, talk about, I say we, but I talk about it a lot, um, in different forums across different planning sectors, locally, regionally, state and nationally. But we are still a, a little bit, of, we've been a little bit ahead of our time still at trying to sell this framework as a, framework for community development because there's still a quite narrow focus around community development, around it being about individual people's capacity rather than a whole community's capacity. And the reason for that is because governments and bureaucrats and stuff find it really hard to measure community capacity and community strength, right? Whereas they can more easily measure an individual's capacity and individual strength, and they love stuff you can measure and prove 
and because it helps them make arguments around policy and money and all the rest of it. So these are quite challenging space to work in when you're a community development specialist like I am, trying to sell the bigger message, which com community development is basically saying you need you need to look at the goals of your community and address your whole community as a whole thing and all the people in it, because community is not a homogenous thing, um, in order for the individuals within that community to have a better life. Um, but <laughs> and they, don't, they just don't like that argument because it's like, well, how do you measure that? And we want the dollars to be working only with these people or only with those people, you know. So, And it's something I've been banging on about for my entire career, which is almost 40 years, and I've been the manager of the Neighbourhood Centre here for 23 years, and we are finally making traction with the state government uh, DCJ is now rolling out these whole of New South Wales community wellbeing surveys, which measure things like trust. How much trust does the uh, people in the community have of their local community organisations? Volunteering. How many people volunteer? How many people are engaged in their local community in different ways? It measure things like that that we know matter. You know. Uh, so we're making traction, <laughs> but there's a long journey to go and um, this whole measuring thing, governments rather wait for everybody to fall over the cliff and then measure how many band-aids, you know, <laughs> how, much, how much blood, you know, how much whatever was administered to patch up the damage after they fell over the cliff, but they really hate the idea of of trying to stop people from falling over the cliff in the first place because you can't measure how many people might have gone over the cliff but for whatever it is that you're saying you did to stop the people falling over the cliff, right? You can't measure the how many people might have gone over the cliff. It's a, so it's the classic argument, you know, the whole results-based accountability framework, which is a planning framework, which says start with the goal Start with the result, don't start with the problem, work towards the goal you want, forget about the problem. That whole philosophy started with a, a famous quote by a, a United States general which went something along the lines of, we know how many bombs we've dropped, we know how many bullets we've fired, we know how many, how many soldiers we've killed, but we don't know if we're winning the war. You know. So, and still, even though governments have subscribed to that results-based accountability philosophy to a large degree, they still don't really get it, to be honest. Thanks. Um, and I acknowledge your community development work and those of others. I want to pick up on this lady's uh, comments earlier. Now, here am I. Uh, a 20-year-old girl, uh, you, you might, be mis might be misled by appearances, thank you. I've, ar I've arrived in Nibbin, I've lived here 18 months. I think I know what's going on around the place and um, I don't have a job that's paid. But um, for any tourists coming to town, so I'm tying in with the, the education, um, the Nimbin area as a realm offering something nowhere else in Australia offers, even if somewhere else does offer it, so what? Um, and I would like to make myself available f to take tourists around or to show them and to tell them, maybe to introduce them so that they can learn from me what goes on here and they can take away from me what sustainable community is, has become and will be in this area. It's my job. Oh, and did I tell you I'm too busy. Uh, my cousin is now wanting to work with me as well. Ah, oh, and of course we have the handouts and the 
books for sale from the local area and so on. Um, I, I hope that ties in. Are you offering to help as yourself or as the 20 year old girl who just moved here? But that's, that, that's your idea, that we engage them to do that. I think that's a good idea. Get recruit them to educate everyone else. Yeah, community liaison. Yeah, Dudley. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a, a strategic plan, if you like, in my head regarding tourism, and that what we need to do is not create another business that aggregates it all to themselves, but we have a business that enables each one of us to be a tour guide, basically, and to to have it promoted, you know, collectively, but we all say how much we want to do, how many days a week and whatever, and which days a week, and then the people get directed. It's like an Uber model, right, where you t say what kind of car you want as well and whatever, but you just order one and you get what's available, that might be a way to do it. And then you get to know someone, oh, I'll come back next time or tell my friend, go to this guy or that woman, you know. So that way it makes it, it we really need flat playing fields and we need um, to, to spread the income as widely as possible in the community. So they start working on things we think are important instead of, you know, pushing consumer goods or doing some other crazy thing that was not in our plan. We've got to have a bigger plan that says what, how we want our economy to work for us, what sort of changes do we want to facilitate, and then we create jobs in those businesses and we all back them. Uh, they have been. Yeah, we, we have tried to. It's The problem is they've got under so much pressure is the problem. Yeah. Um, I was just sitting here with my reflection in between um, your intervention before, the one about advertising to the rest of the country, Australia, and what um, the brother man here um, said about brought in the concept of working with the income tourists and what he said as well. Um, and I think that that's way more fertile um, field, like working with the people that they, have, they make the choice to come to the region and see it, because it's way easier to work and share knowledge with people that already try to open the door in themselves, trying to advertise nationwide, I think, or worldwide, because that's just the things that comes. Ed educate, but well, we used the word advertise before, so um, advertise or educate. I think I think I think that realistically, with the challenge, the intergenerational challenge that this area is following now, energy-wise, is extremely hard to do it because trying to go in and change or bring in idea where beliefs are totally different um, is extremely hard, and we have to make to come with that too. Working with people that come to the area or they do an online research or that they actually wanted to open the door themselves, I think is way more um, feasible. And um, what was the other thing? There was another thing in my mind. Um, um, which is that now? But it might, yeah, it might come back now. Yes. You mentioned about people that want to jump over the cliff. My question, okay, my question is, what's your rescue remedy for people in Nimbin that want to jump over the cliff? Uh, will you answer to that? Or I'll, I'll quickly answer it. Hang on to it. Uh, 
They're not wanting to jump over the cliff. <laughs> it's more like falling over the cliff in spite of your best efforts. And then it's just more, it was more a metaphor to explain governments and, and how they like measuring stuff. And they'd rather wait till you were over the cliff and then measure how many band-aids they had to put on rather than wait, put things in place before people go over the cliff so they don't go over the cliff because they can't measure it, see? So it's, it's actually, nobody wants to go over the cliff. Well, no, there's probably the odd person who wants to jump off a cliff, but that's not what I was talking about. I was, I was talking about data and measurement and trying to get um, policy on board when... They're not very interested in prevention and much more interested in having a problem and then looking like they're coming to the rescue to fix it. Fix it. What, what you want is uh, a support community support system to help people that have uh, traumatic issues and that's part of community resilience. Uh, yes, and that's our core business at the Neighbourhood Centre. So we work with family and domestic violence, mental health issues, poverty, food, provide food relief. This is our everyday business, homelessness. Uh, we work at a trauma -informed, through a trauma-informed lens and right now we're heavily focused on disaster recovery work, working with people who have been impacted by the 2022 floods. So that is the core business of the Neighbourhood Centre. That is what we're there for. Um, that is our service delivery part of it, and we are the primary providers in Nimbin of those services. Uh, but our other area of work is the community development work, which is what I'm here talking about right now. Um, that area of work around vulnerable people and trauma-informed practice and all of that comes under the health and wellbeing framework under the sustainability plan. Um, but that's our core business at the Neighbourhood Centre. So don't worry, we are looking after those people. And, and don't worry, they do come through our doors, hundreds of them all the time. But before I get back to you, you're still... You know, um, yeah, it came to my mind. The other things I wanted to say is just that um, on that education, working on the people that come or that try to have interest, an active interest already with this area, I think is more the way to go than actually try to educate nationwide. Um, the other reason in my mind is because we are not facing something nationwide or worldwide that is casually, it's not that people around casually don't see what is possible. The system out there is an extremely like working machine. So if we try to engage mediating and trying to propagate an idea spreading nationwide, we, you, you will encounter like media war done in a way that they know how to do it. And there is a the big risk. Um, I mean, the area here is extremely as strong as fragile. There is this big gift on this land. Um, and there is so many layers that interact with it. When you mentioned bringing in um, um, Aboriginal people, First Nation people in a meeting, one of the, I mean, I spent quite a good time with them. And one of the very big things that I've learned is just that there is, um, there is a lot that comes active in our conscious and that's what we can educate but there is even more in our unconscious that manage that has to do with this land it can it actually has to do with this land different part of australia will have different relation with the land um there is a reason why on the wall east coast where the first contact happened the banjo nation is one of the few if not i think the only one that managed to preserve the language is that is that more than one yeah yeah well, that's what that's what that's what they say. I know, I know, but on the degree, on the on the big one, yeah. That, 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 I know. That's that's what that's what I was saying with them. But uh, but I think there's a lot of elements that have to do with the land, and um, and with um, relation and energy with the land. Yeah. Um, but to bring it back to what I'm actually trying to find out here. Because, look, this is the kind of conversation we have in the context of developing the strategies for the plan. But the, the, the wicked problem I have right now is how do I get as many people involved in up do, redoing the plan um, so that we keep going ahead with the work, the good work that we're doing. And this is where I'm really interested in 
young people, <laughs> you're like our token young person, sorry about that, uh, the youngest person in the room pretty much. Um, but look, is there some sort of online opportunity, like what can I do that make it easier? Because it's really hard for young people right now to give up whole days of their life on a weekend when most of them are struggling to pay the rent. Like they've got, even when I was a young person, I could go around and blockade and get arrested, spend time locked up and still have an income through the dole. You can't do that now, right? You can't survive like we could. In, indeed. I feel like the people who would be enticed by a sale and something is not the people you want to attract. But but you do need an enticement. You know, if you if you want a big scale um, meeting that's important and you're worrying it about drawing people in, you need to attach it to entertainment. Is as uh, Dudley was saying that the edgy okay entertainment. So like there you what you want is. I'd say you want something semi semi regular, um, so that it's not like a one off. Oh, so and so didn't show up. It's not pieced together. It, it needs to be. Um, personally, I've been thinking, and through my connections, and as David celebrated, some of my good friends, the Seeding, a very powerful band in the area, who played opening the festival here on Friday night. Um, which unfortunately was a clash with some beautiful First Nations bands, but um, I, th I think that would be your format. Would be have your meeting in the hall and have music and entertainment that afternoon and evening. I would suggest once a month um, in this venue would be my suggestion. Um, yeah, and then, but yeah, the big thing is. I'm not even sure those young people live in the area, but I know that when a reasonably priced deal or even a work for accommodation deal pops up anywhere in the area, people are lining up at the door because they don't have somewhere to live. Um, so if, you, if that's transparent, what you're offering is somewhere to live, um, like see, Opportunity, land to live, development skills, um, you know, working with the community to establish housing. And for me, my idea, I would personally like to move onto a land, onto land, live there, establish, put a whole bunch of trees in the ground, and and build a hempcrete or a weedcrete, which I miss that um, workshop or something like that, or air creek, or what, whatever is most suitable, I'm still working it out, and then move on, and th or light, light earth. Or, and then, so what you need is an incentivized package that, um, the, that ins works that way. So you're, you can bring young people on, and I don't think young people are ready to commit to a lifetime on a particular community. You, what you need is, a, like a deal that that you've got somewhere to live for six months. This is what, and and that group therefore can do that community place after place, and then leaves it more habitable for more, for growth going on. So, are you suggesting that I bribe them and go? On the provision that you promised to turn up to our sustainable Nimbin planning days, we'll find you somewhere to live. Do you reckon that'll work? Uh, almost. <laughs> almost. Yeah. almost. Yeah. Or if you promise to volunteer a certain number of hours in our community, we'll find you somewhere to live? That's not that. I knew. I was being a bit facetious. I was being, we've got another token young person in the room, and you're quite young as well. So do you want to throw anything in the mix as another token young person? No, no, no worries. I've, I've been thinking about how I can contribute to the conversation, but it's, it's all very interesting and it really resonates with my partner and I of, uh, yeah, I found this spot more comfortable. Um, 
but I mean, for for us personally, being foreigners, um, I mean, obviously in the long run, it would be difficult to, I mean, we'd have to figure out like a, a working skilled trade with visas and stuff, like a lot of stuff that I haven't fully done the research on. But I mean, if there was some kind of like sponsorship or something, so people from other countries can come here and like help this grow. Um, because I, I mean, being from the US, I, I know quite a few people who are like into this kind of stuff, but we don't have any sort of community to like base it off of. Um, I've had friends who, sorry? <laughs> Am I not holding it close enough, the microphone? Is that what you said? Oh, make one. Okay, sorry. But, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, like, I feel like if I told a lot of, like, my friends about this place, they'd, they'd be like, that's awesome that they have, like, that much of an established community and resources to, like, actually make this happen. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's my two cents on that. Yeah, where are you from? Yeah, U.S. Where else in U.S.? Utah. So let, let me put this to you. So say we're in Utah right now and I was asking you, how do I get a bunch of young people in Utah around, around the table for a conversation about the community development? What do you think would attract them? Because young people, young pe all over the world, the same sort of issues that young people are facing. So how, what do you think would entice them to come around and have the conversation? Just that's because that's really my question. Like, because obviously there's another question about how do we entice young people like you to come to our community. But just imagine we're in Utah, and I'm asking you, how do I get you and your friends to come and talk about this subject? What would entice them to turn up? Do you reckon? <laughs> um. I, th I mean, I think a lot of these kind of, I guess you could say buzzwords like permaculture and not to like downplay any of that. Like it's, I think that's a, a big part of the dream of like the new consciousness that's rising, you know, for the, the coming generations. Um, yeah, permaculture and sustainable living. Um, and being supportive of people being able to medicate in ways that they they choose and like body freedom and just being able to like be yourself in these communities i think that all really resonates with those kind of underground communities that are trying to find like more of a, a stable community like a town like this where like there's actually organizations or, like happening to make a dream happen. Thank you for your input. It's just a very important bridge. Uh, there is, it's already in the working model of the of the government to incentivize young uh, foreigners and young people to pick fruit and work rurally if the if the if um if that's available if i'm just in through this conversation if then that's three months uh rural working so if you if you're looking at a fr frame where you're getting this and the skill share facet that you're saying nimbin does have a lot of that skill um and knowledge if that's packaged and offered then you're getting people in and that's that's um that's the, just that on that idea. In terms of getting people to a meeting, I think yeah, in, incorporating it into a, like a larger event with entertainment and food and, and yeah. yeah, we always do loads of food, but yeah, maybe we need a band. Um, you yeah, know, I really agree with Bob. With Bob, with what Bob was saying about having meeting with music and entertainment, and prior to that, other talks. 
And um, I want to acknowledge what he was saying because he's my path as well from finance. But it's a conversation that is out because we have a whole lot of other things to cope with. Like he's talking actually about sponsorship, not in uh, three months. He's talking about having legal things. Because you say, oh, why don't you start a community? I say, well, I'm not even allowed to be here until I respect all these rules before I move the first step. And, but these things, just think that unless you come from a foreign country, it's very hard to tap in. But we have to cope with that, so leave it out of here. A thing that I feel that is very important to raise, which is, is what comes after, because it, um, what he brought up saying um, having formats like, you know, six months on a property, because you say a lot of young people maybe don't want to really to commit for, for a whole life in one community. So having the chance to experience six months, you know, you have work, you do some work and you have accommodation, that's for your care. And that's actually what I've been doing for the last few years. But then I see for myself and for other people, they are dealing with that, then there is a big step because it comes, and I was really curious in what you brought up, saying that you have a strategic plan and financial plans and that kind of thing, because somehow the, biggest, the big step is still like ruled by money, which is a thing that the world is trying to leave behind, but we are in that transition things, because say, all right, I want to live in this community and things, say, all right, but then to buy, actually, to buy the title to be there, it still goes down to money. And a lot of people, if they commit for six months to do some work in the property in exchange of accommodation with the cost of living and doing maybe some other sorts of volunteering in town and a little bit of work because they're still nourishing the person because it's what this region really believes on, even after six months, they won't, they won't have their accessibility. So I think there would be some of the works needs to be done in set up some sorts of... Um, parallel or complementary things to work with money. It needs to be built on trust. But how do we, if someone after, after having done that six months in our community decided, okay, I want to be part of this, but my finance still do not allow me. So there needs to be something that is based both on trust and in and paying off through time in a different way than pay, they pay up front. Because your generation or older generation, for them, gathering up the money was actually way easier than what it is nowadays. It, no, it was not only less, but even to access money, it was much easier to get a loan or, or the cost of living, even proportionally, not just in amount, was much less than what it is nowadays. So if someone has to do yeah, so you got a message anyway. Again, that's another topic that came up on the MI think tanks about some kind of how do we help young people buy in over, like you say, time to time to pay, rent to buy kind of idea. Just before I move back to you, Dudley Lee, I just want to hear from our other token young person in the room to see if you've got anything to add to this conversation. Okay. Um, I am another foreigner here. Um, my partner, we're from the US. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I've um, been trying to think of ways to contribute. Um, just to kind of touch on what you said a little bit, it is difficult for young people now to feel that they can um, commit themselves to a community um, because I think we have so much um, to face for our futures that makes it hard to think like, oh, I could see myself living here because yeah, cost is so incredibly hard. It consumes our life just trying to work and survive and live. Like we've been living in a van for, um, a little while now and we had to do it in the states as well and um yeah there's so much um that is just like all consuming for us that it makes it hard to sit down and say you know let me devote my entire life savings to this and you don't even know if it's going to work out you don't even know if you want to be there it's terrifying really um but to kind of touch on what you're after here um trying to involve youth um I don't know what exactly goes on in the community because we're not from here, um, but just events marketed to the youth, potentially, um, like a 20s and 30s event um, just to get people together and you know people in that age group um, just kind of all together in one space and you know, sharing their ideas, maybe building a network amongst the youth and those people getting to know each other, um, whether that's monthly, as you were suggesting, um, just a way to kind of bring people into the community for an event that's 
specifically for them, um, and that can potentially draw more interest into the community overall. Look, it's really good to have your input. And thanks very much for you coming and hanging out with us old people here today. <laughs> and when we're talking about young people, we tend to be talking about maybe 40 and under. <laughs> That's what we're calling young. Um, Dudley, you wanted to say something? I know you're itching to say something. Uh, yeah, look... Most of the things have been talked about in the last little while by young people um, are absolutely essential part of what we're doing. Uh, we, in fact, the community that my wife and I started 50 years ago is already having young people come and stay for as long as they want once they've gone through the first sort of stage of knowing they actually want to be there and that other people want them to be there. Um, that's all part of being community. But that that, that is, has... Been, we saw the need for that. There were young people that wanted to know about it, really wanted to do permaculture and stuff, but they weren't sure, didn't want to commit to a community. That was obvious, it's sensible. So we facilitate that. So that's already happening. And the communities that I'm talking about setting up will be even more focused on the big picture, which is the planet, and how do we make it all work. So we need these centres all over the place I call them training camps, you know, to train for good life. And then you can go anywhere in the network around the world to do your good work and be much appreciated by the people that need a lot of help. So this is the future. This is the, the industry of the future is learning how to live well and then getting out there and helping everyone else to live well. That's more than enough for all of us to do for the rest of our lives because there's a lot to be done and every step we take makes the world a better place and every time the world's a better place it gets better and better and better it grows on itself it generates that it re through resonance you know it, it start the Rupert Sheldrake if you study him at all he talks a lot about the that whole issue the presence of the past and the things like that and uh, he uh, uh, in any rate, he, he's phenomenal to get on to and listen to what he's saying. He's on the internet. But he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Scientists and has been since he was in his 20s, you know. He's locked in to Cambridge and all that. And he's got all these connections. There's so much going on in this, the good science area about all these issues, primarily about consciousness and what it is. And that's the one common thing we've all got. You know, we're all consciousness. That's all we really are. So we have to treat each other as equals, bits of consciousness, and we figure out how to get that consciousness really happening because it's been suppressed, oppressed, whatever, for thousands of years, and now's the time we can break out, and that's how it happens. That's how life evolves. It has to be put under sufficient pressure and get to know enough about the problems to be able to say, well, it's none of those, so I'm wasting your time on that. This is the old Zen Buddhist thing, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. Eliminate, eliminate, eliminate until you find what's left. You know, it's the gold at the bottom of the, the pan. That's how the gold finding works. The gold, is, the real gold, of course, is us. That's the one that's been sidelined. They're sidelining us as much as possible, making out that we're a problem because we're a problem to them, a problem to consumption and unlimited wealth. So we're their enemy, but we don't want to be. We don't want enemies. We want everyone to come on board and have a good life for all of us. The only way we'll get there if we do it together. So you've got to, we've got to stop naming and shaming and all this stuff. They're just ignorant, that's all. They don't know what's good for them. Yeah, really, they don't know what's good for themselves because what's good for them is good for all of us and vice versa. So just one thing going back to saying why we can't, rely on government because they are a corporate entity. The Australian government's resident in the New York Stock Exchange. You can go and have a look. It was sold out by Whitlam. It's all real. But the, the point is they're a corporation and you can't expect a dog to act like a cat. You know, corporations are about making a profit. Everybody knows that. that they've got, they don't have to defend themselves against that accusation. That's what they're there for. Everybody knows that. But because they've been so clever in controlling people through 
through all that system of money and the total rig and fraud that money is, they've been able to get control. Well, time's run out for all of us, you know, and if we don't wake up now and life doesn't come raging through us, which it is, started here 50 years ago, but it's now it's time it has to get out everywhere. What we've done in 50 years is learn a hell of a lot about what's really important and what isn't, how to get what's really important, how to do it. This whole place is going to turn into an incredible edutainment centre of centres, networks of them. And then we'll start exporting these these amazing people who go out there and we just want to do their service and save the planet and look after people. That's the future. There's no other future. It's a waste of time talking about anything in between. We've just got to jump right into it and do it now and fast as possible because they're not expecting us to come back with an answer now. They think they've got us. And you look around and you say, yeah, they've got us, all right? A lot of people saying that. They've got no hope left. And that's the critical point. If you don't act now, there be, won't be enough people to get. We've got to save people. And the way to save them is show them is that there is an answer and we're doing it. And we believe enough in that answer, it'll come across, it'll change. Nothing else does. Our thoughts create. Plato said our thoughts are the creators. They're actually creating. Just having a thought, so be careful what you think. In defence of um, dogs and cats, my cat's actually really good at playing catch. Like she goes, you throw the thing, she chases it, brings it back, drops it at my feet, meows. Yeah, my cat actually plays fetch. So you can teach a cat to be a dog. <laughs> Maybe not a dog to be a cat, though. Um, anyway, we have a plan, and the community, the Nimbin community, has a plan. The Neighbourhood Centre has a stewardship, steward, stewardship role in relation to that plan, which is basically it's our job to make sure the plan keeps going, that we're keeping track of what's been achieved under the plan, that we're reporting back to the community about what's been achieved under the plan, not by the Neighbourhood Centre, by the community, and then getting the community back around the table to update the plan. So I'm just revising what I'm here on about. <laughs> this is not a very good microphone, is it? Um, no, especially if I stand in front of the fold back, that doesn't help at all, sorry about that. Um, so I've got a few more hands raised. We've only got about five more minutes to go. But I'm still trying to brainstorm. I'm still trying to get it out of you. What would make you, even though you don't live here, most of you, uh, and you won't be here when we do do the revision of the plan, but nonetheless, wherever you were, might be, if someone said to you, what would make you turn up and contribute to the development of a community plan, that's what I'm trying to find out. I'm trying to find out what would make you turn up. Would it be food? Would it be free joints? <laughs> would it be a really good band? You know, what would make you turn up? Um, so that's really what I'm drilling down to. So we've had lots of suggestions. Market it, make it, you know, make it sexy as well. Sex it up somehow. Um, one of the other aspects about people wanting to engage is an outcome. So you don't want to waste time. If your time is considered valuable at this end, every cent I spend on my time is cent that could be money spent to my children or my education or all of those things. So to actually have put invest time into the community, they have to feel a, an actual outcome from themselves from it. Recognition as future leadership skills. So enticing them to be engaged in community engagement for future um, resume building skills. They don't necessarily have access to those community um, mentors. So in, in inviting them to come in, you're offering a mentorship to them that they don't necessarily can engage in any other way. That's one way of selling it to them. It, Bribery is never going to work because it's non-sustainable. 
you have to in incentivise them to want to do it themselves. And the best way they have is agency in the town from it. Yep. So you're not going to get them by fear. You have to get them by future motivation of what they'll get out of it. And they then take job owners um, agency, they take education of their children and what Dudley's done in setting that original um, package meant that everybody that came in here knew what they were getting out of it and I think that the children at this point and the younger children aren't really sure what their outcome is going to be and that's why they're not engaging. Adults can see where they can really get this foot in but for children to see that and 20-year-olds um, to foresee that far in the future what that outcome is going to be, it's not immediate, it's not now, it's not giving them things now. So you've got the two-prong, give them now and what they're going to see from their gain in the future to engage. Okay, I'm getting the wrap up. Stop working just in time. So the microphone stopped working just in the nick of time because I'm entitled to give the wrap up. So I take one more comment. So we're a bit outnumbered right now because of the Aquarius Festival. So that happened 50 years ago. So a lot of the people that are here in town right now are original Aquarians. Um, so they're, you know, pushing 80 um, and upwards. So we've got more older people hanging around right now than usual. Uh, but it still is an ageing community. So the demographic is something like... And it's getting older as well. I've forgotten the exact stat, but I think we're something like 68% of us are over the age of 55 or something like that. So we do have a shrinking younger population and they've been driven out of the town because of housing costs and stuff like that, which is something us older people really need to grapple with. Um, so I take it... So, yes, it's a good question. But they are actually... There are young people here. And a lot of them are the... Um, offspring of the original Aquarius or the offspring of the offspring of the original Aquarius. So they have deep roots in the community, um, but they're just really under a lot of pressure to survive. So, but I hear what you're saying. It's a good question. How do you get young people in the room if there isn't any? You know, <laughs> we pushed them all out. So that's why I take you on board what you guys are saying about sponsorships and the rest of it. But I'm definitely getting the wrap up now. Dave's telling me to go away. But I think I have to wrap it up. But thanks very much for coming.